Chapter 6 Blessing of Norse Gods Beneath the pregnant moon, Camp Gelsonth came alive with the harsh glow of torchlight against the encroaching darkness. The Norse priestess Visenya stood as an ethereal beacon amidst the gathering storm of Viking warriors. Her face was a stark canvas of blue and black coal, transforming her visage into a reflection of the otherworldly. Draped in the austerity of a beige gown, she held aloft a staff crowned with a pulsing red stone, its presence as commanding as the tide of Northmen that swelled around her. Warriors of the North Sea, lay thine blades and axes upon sacred ground. Visenya's voice cut through the night, a clarion call to those who sought the favour of deities unseen. The circle formed around her, Weapons clattering on the earth, surrounding the grisly pike where Norbenton's magistrate's head impaled, mouth agape in silent protest, flies feasting upon his final grimace. At the heart of this profane circle, a sigil lay etched in the dirt, dark and foreboding, the symbol of Helia, goddess of the shadowed realm. Sigurd, son of the north! Why doth thy sword remain sheathed in defiance? Visenya's eyes narrowed upon the towering figure who stood apart, his broad shoulders casting long shadows beneath the lunar gaze. Visenya, Cyrus, Sigurd replied, his voice steady as the ancient mountains of his homeland. I seek not the whispered promises of Helia. I am forged of battle and blood, not of death's caress. His piercing blue eyes usually calm like a frozen lake, now flashed with the fire of resistance. Thy refusal casts doubt upon thy allegiance. Can Mosdeville be conquered without the mistress of death's blessing? Visenya's challenge hung between them, a spectre of suspicion. Enough! The word thundered from Valdemar, his stature rivaling that of Sigurd's. This man's valour needs no testament but the battlefield. He is the tempest incarnate, his loyalty unassailable. A murmur of assent rippled through the assembled Vikings, acknowledging the respect owed to their peerless warrior. Without another word, Sigurd turned his back to the ritual, his trusted companion Bronth at his side. Their footsteps were deliberate as they made their way to a distant altar, lit by the soft glow of votive flames, an homage to Gondlir, deity of honour and might. Let us find solace in the strength of Gondlir, Sigurd confided in Bronth, his words infused with a reverence that belied his imposing form. We shall trust his shield to guard us when dawn breaks over the field of war. Bronth nodded, his own heart swelling with the same conviction that burned within Sigurd's breast. Together, they stood before the altar, inhaling the incense-laden air, their spirits armoured with unshakable faith as the rites of darkness unfurled behind them. Visenya's voice cut through the night, a chilling blade that commanded the attention of all who surrounded her. Kneel, she intoned her gaze sweeping over the remaining warriors like the prow of a longship parting icy waters. Invoke Helia's might and ask for the power to vanquish our enemies. Let your blades drink of her indomitable will. The Norsemen complied, their armoured knees striking the earth with a collective thud that resonated in the solemn air. They were a phalanx of shadows beneath the swollen moon heads bowed in reverence to the deity whose favour they sought. Zol Luth, Vorochitu, Ethnok, Von Lipitka, Visenya chanted, her eyes flaring with otherworldly fervour as she traced the ancient runes upon her staff. The words, primal and enigmatic, rose from the throats of the Vikings, a chorus that swelled with the rising gale blasting in from the North Sea. A sinister glow emanated from the vacant orbs of the magistrate's severed head. 
its macabre visage now an icon of their dark supplication. Visenya's hand moved with purpose, igniting the Helia sigil, which burst into flames, casting dancing shadows upon the ring of surrendered weaponry. The winds carried whispers, or so it seemed, the voice of the death goddess herself weaving amidst the chanting warriors. Then, as if summoned by their collective will, lightning cleaved the sky, striking the sigil with divine fury. A blinding flash surged, bathing every weapon in a spectral light that seared itself into the very metal. Arise now and reclaim what is yours. Visenya's command was fierce, her presence the embodiment of the tempestuous goddess they adored. The Norsemen stood, their hands closing around hilt and haft, with a newfound confidence that thrummed within their veins. Valdemar surveyed his brethren, noting the change wrought upon them, a transformation from mere mortals to instruments of Helia's wrath. Our strength is renewed, yet we shall not be blinded by arrogance, he cautioned, his voice heavy with the weight of past defeats. Mosdeville's fortitude is not to be trifled with. The silence from our scouts spells ill news, and Norbenton's remnants may well have fortified their defences. He paused, a frown creasing his brow as he contemplated their next move. Furthermore, de Gell has not sent word. Our assault there may have faltered. He locked eyes with each warrior in turn, ensuring his message was received. We wield the power of a goddess, but caution must be our watchword. Another loss is a luxury we cannot afford. The men nodded, their expressions a mix of determination and grim acceptance. Each felt the solemnity of Valdemar's words, knowing that the coming dawn would herald not just another battle, but a fight for their very destiny. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The moon hung like a watchful guardian over Mosdeville as Amy and Edric made their silent approach. The hems of their cloaks trailed through the dew-laden grass, leaving darkened trails in their wake. In Emmy's grasp was a leather satchel, innocuous to any onlooker, yet it bore the macabre trophies of her latest encounter, a human heart among other visceral remnants. Edric marched beside her, his expression etched with conflict. Since witnessing Emmy's arcane prowess, a chasm had formed between them, filled with his brooding disappointment and an undercurrent of fear. Dark magic had stained her hands, and he struggled to reconcile the image of the woman he knew with the sorceress that walked beside him now. They had neared the edge of the village when the clangor of steel jolted Edric from his troubled reverie. Armed guards, stern-faced and vigilant, encircled them with grim purpose. The guard's captain stepped forward, his voice resounding with authority. Emi Zinathush, by order of the magistrate, you are hereby arrested for the crime of witchcraft, Beric declared, motioning his men forward. Edric's muscles tensed, a primal urge to protect surging within him, yet he was rendered speechless caught in the vice of his own indecision. To intervene would be folly, yet to do nothing felt like betrayal. Stand down, Edric Perrymane, Beric warned, noticing the young man's internal struggle. This is the law of Mosdeville. Interference will only worsen her predicament. The guards closed in, their gauntlets closing upon Amy's arms with unyielding firmness. Their touch seemed to break the spell that had ensnared Edric. A torrent of protest threatened to escape his lips, but it died there, smothered by the weight of his uncertainty. He watched, helplessly, as they led Emmy away. The enigma wrapped in shadows, her destiny now entwined with the merciless gears of justice. Do not worry, Edric, 
Amy said with a smile upon her face. The spirits will guide us both. We each have a destiny. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Several miles to the west, the hushed hall of Degel was punctuated by the soft murmur of prayer, as priest John, his hands steady and experienced, applied a poultice of lemon balm to Minister Duncan Mightwood's swollen arm. The air was tinged with the acrid scent of medicinal herbs and the coppery tang of spilled blood that had not been scrubbed away from the previous night's carnage. Keep still, Minister, John advised, his voice a soothing cadence amidst the clatter of the town in disarray beyond the thick walls. Guards flanked the chamber's entrance, their faces etched with the fatigue of battle and loss. With an effort that tightened the lines around his eyes, Duncan nodded, his gaze wandering over the maps and plans strewn across the grand table. Elsa, he croaked, his voice hoarse but commanding. The wolf. Did it survive the onslaught? Elsa, bearing a resilience in her eyes that matched the sturdiness of the longbow slung across her back, approached her father. It did more than survive, father. It tore through the raiders, left devastation in its wake. But now, it has vanished into the woods. And what of Indri and Frederick? Duncan's mind turned to matters beyond the stone walls, to the safety of his people, to strategies yet unfurled. Unaccounted for, since yester-eve. Elsa's brows furrowed with concern, yet her stance remained resolute. A shadow flickered across Duncan's features, but it was quickly replaced by an unwavering confidence. Indri has the cunning of a fox, he said firmly. She will return to us unharmed. And Frederick, he has the honour of a true knight. Together, they are more than capable of surviving whatever the forest sends their way. His youngest daughter, Varya, hovered near the edges of the room, her hands wringing the hem of her tunic. But father, what if... Enough, Varya, Duncan interjected gently. Fear will not aid us now. He turned his attention to Milton, his chief military adviser, who stood at the ready. Milton, gather the men. We must strike back while their bloodlust is sated with victory. We will find them, and with Mosdeville's help, we shall deliver retribution. A grim smile found its way onto Elsa's lips. A rare glint of satisfaction amid the dread. Duncan pushed himself upright, wincing at the pull of his wounds. Take me to the cellar. I wish to see this captured Dane with my own eyes. Milton offered his arm to support the minister as they made their way down the dimly lit corridor, their footsteps echoing a march towards an uncertain future. Each step was a testament to Duncan's resolve, to the indomitable spirit of de Gell, that would not yield to fear or falter under the shadow of impending war. As they descended into the belly of the tavern where the raider was held, Duncan's thoughts turned once more to the fate of his town and the hope that Indri and Frederick would return with news vital to their survival. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The salty tang of the North Sea air filled their nostrils as Indri and Frederick crouched in the shadows, just beyond the flickering light of the Viking encampment. Tents billowed like ghostly sentinels against the night sky, their outlines stark beneath the full moon's relentless gaze. Stay close, Frederick murmured, his voice barely audible over the crashing waves in the distance. With a deft motion, he drew his dagger, a blade that had tasted the blood of many an enemy, and surveyed the perimeter. Indri nodded, her sling taut in her grip. Her eyes, sharp as flint, scanned for movement. They move with the stealth of hunting wolves, synchrony born of necessity in these times of war and whispering death. 
their first obstacle was a lone guard, his silhouette hunched and unsuspecting. In one swift, silent surge, Frederick was upon him. The guard's gasp was cut short by a wet gurgle as the dagger slit his throat, his body crumpling to the earth without ceremony. Not moments later, another sentry appeared, a hulking brute gripping a heavy axe. Indri swung her arm in an arc, releasing the stone from her sling. It whistled through the air, finding its mark with lethal precision. The man fell, his cries stifled by the sudden onslaught of unconsciousness, or perhaps death. By the gods, your aim is true, Frederick whispered, his tone laced with respect. Let's press on, she replied her focus unswayed. They slipped through the camp, phantoms among the living, until they neared the central fire where Valdemar stood, his imposing figure casting long shadows as he addressed his warriors. Tomorrow, Mosdeville shall fall, Valdemar bellowed, his words carrying a weight of finality. We will spare none and claim our rightful vengeance. Damnation, Frederick cursed under his breath. We must warn them. Too late, came a hushed feminine voice. They turned to see Olga, the Viking priestess, emerging from the tent's sable folds, her gaze piercing the dark. We've already sent forth a war party to your precious town. Then you're coming with us, Frederick said seizing her arm with a firm hand. You may yet serve a purpose. With haste born of desperation, they fled the encampment, the priestess in tow, racing against the impending dawn and the grim promise it held for Mosdeville. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The town hall of Mosdeville was steeped in tension, a thrumming current that resonated through the wooden beams and into the hearts of those gathered. Emmy stood alone, her dark hair a stark contrast against the pallor of her skin, her presence a focal point for the crowd's mingled fear and fascination. Let it be known, Christopher Hesselman intoned, his voice echoing off the walls, commanding the room's attention. His eyes, steely mirrors of conviction, rested on Emmy that we stand before the Almighty in pursuit of truth and justice. Ermi Zinathush stands accused of witchcraft, of consorting with the abominations that lurk beyond our God-fearing lands, he continued, his gaze never waning from the young woman before him. But we are not savages, to convict without proof or to condemn without cause. Whispers race through the spectators their unease a palpable shroud in the still air. We uphold the virtues our forefathers bestowed upon this settlement, a bastion of mercy amid corruption, Christopher declared, the timber of his voice resolute. This trial, this quest for veracity and rectitude, it underscores our commitment to what is righteous and holy. Amy remained silent her enigmatic eyes reflecting an inner fortitude that belied her calm exterior. The fate of Mosdeville hung in the balance, teetering at the edge of a knife. One that threatened not only her life, but the very soul of the community she had come to call home. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Christopher Hesselman's fingers trembled ever so slightly as he unfurled the aged parchment, each crinkle reverberating through the hushed assembly like the distant rumble of thunder. Behold the evidence, he said, his voice a low rumble. Books inscribed in tongues unknown to God-fearing men. He hoisted the tomes high for all to see, their covers etched with esoteric symbols that seemed to dance menacingly in the flickering light. Within her abode, under her care, Christopher continued, pausing for the weight of his words to take hold, lay a Danish warrior beset by illness, 
a man riddled with festering sores and fevered delirium. His eyes narrowed, accusatory and piercing as he painted a grim tableau of suffering. Is it not our Christian duty to tend to the ailing, no matter the blood that courses through their veins? Yet, he intoned gravely, what mercy is found in the hands that bind and torment an enemy thus? A collective shudder swept through the crowd, faces previously flushed with anger, now paled at the stark imagery conjured by Christopher's oration. The prosecutor's implication was clear. Such cruelty could only be the work of one consorting with darkness. Having woven his narrative of malevolence, Christopher settled into his seat with the solemnity of a judge passing sentence, his eyes fixed upon Emmy as if to divine any sliver of remorse. But it was not Emmy who rose to speak next. Rather, it was Leona, wife of Beric, whose stature commanded an immediate silence. Esteemed folk of Mosdeville, Leona began, her voice rich with the warmth of familiarity. I stand before you in defence of Emmy Zinathush. She moved towards Emmy, her poise unyielding against the tide of suspicion. This young woman, whom I've watched grow from an infant left in swaddling at the church's cold doorstep, has blossomed into a beacon of service for our community. Ciela Payden, my own kinswoman, raised her within these walls after Aelithi abandoned her, Leona said, gesturing gracefully toward the heart of Mosdeville. Respected weaver and steadfast believer, Ciela imparted unto Emi the virtues of hard work and charity. Not once has Emi sought to harm those who call this place home. Indeed, Leona conceded, her gaze sweeping across the sea of faces. She may possess knowledge that lies beyond our ken, knowledge that, yes, perhaps she used against those marauding Vikings. Her eyes then settled on Emmy, filled with a sorrowful defiance. But consider the intention behind her actions. Noble, designed to protect, not to persecute. To hang her for such deeds would be to snuff out a life that has been, and continues to be, a bulwark against our true foes. The room lapsed into a tense quietude, each person grappling with the gravity of Leona's plea. Here stood two visions of justice, one demanding retribution, the other begging mercy, and between them the fate of Emi Zinathosh hung precariously in the balance.